Welcome back to Pop Culture Graveyard. I am Hollis, and today I want to talk about one of my all-time favorite post-punk bands, Gang of Four. For a kid like me, who loved punk music, but also liked to dance, Gang of Four was heaven sent. The original Gang of Four's sound is very unique, melding the propulsive guitar of Dr. Feelgood's Wilco Johnson with the grinding rhythms of James Brown's original JBs. Gang of Four was a furious, uncompromising unit who were equally appealing to amped up bodies on the dance floor or to those standing up against a wall trying to act cool. So please join me for a profile of the funk punk pioneers Gang of Four. This way, comrade. Before I begin this week, I want to give a quick shout out to the newest members of my Patreon, Annabelle, Tom, Joe, Dave, Bob1, Bob2, and Chris. Thank you for your support. If you would like to support the show, please visit my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash popculturegraveyard. Now on with the show. Gang of Four were formed in the liberal arts department of Leeds University, the same fertile ground that produced the Mekons and Delta Five, claiming to be a democratic band without a star. Unlike most bands, Gang of Four's political talk was not just talk. Named after the four Communist Party officials who came to power during the Cultural Revolution, Gang of Four ran their band more like Marxists than rock stars. Each member of the group split the song publishing evenly, and everyone in the Gang of Four organization, from the band members to their entourage, were all on the same weekly wage of 30 pounds. With the exception of the road crew, who got double that amount when the band went on tour. Gang of Four was Hugo Burnham on drums, Dave Allen on bass, Andy Gill on guitar, and John King on vocals and melodica. In September of 1979, the band released Entertainment. If someone asked me for one album that defined post-punk in its purest form, I'd direct them to Entertainment rather than Joy Division's Unknown Pleasures. While Joy Division is an excellent post-punk band, there are other factors at work in their music. The romantic darkness of The Doors, the blank futurism of David Bowie, the smooth syncopation of a human heartbeat. In fact, thanks to Martin Hannett, the producer, there's a certain warmth to the songs on Unknown Pleasures that entertainment is devoid of. Entertainment is a cold, angular, dispassionate recording, which purposefully does not recreate the band's live sound. Entertainment keeps you at arm's distance, and that's post-punk at its purest. I have to talk a little bit about the cover design of this album. The artwork shows a Native American and a cowboy shaking hands back in the Wild West with dialogue wrapping around the boxes, which say, the Indian smiles, he thinks the cowboy is his friend. The cowboy smiles, he is glad the Indian is fooled. Now he can exploit him. It's all right there. Talk about wearing your political agenda on your sleeve, literally. Lead off track Ether is as hard rocking a track as any punk outfit produced in 79. John King's vocals are shadowed by Andy Gill's vocals, which are performing a different set of lyrics. They would also use this technique to great effect on other songs on this album. But here it creates just the right spooky vibe for this song's subject matter, with lyrics that speak of white noise in a white room. This is the funkiest song about torturing IRA prisoners ever. The band name check Long Cash Royal Air Force Station, now known as Her Majesty's Prison Maze, where supposedly hooded IRA suspects were subjected to white noise until their spirits were broken. The tone of this song really lets listeners know right away that this band were not dealing in disposable ideas. If you're not into Gang of Four already, some of you may still recognize the irresistible rhythmic perfection of the song Natural's Not In It, which was used in a TV commercial for the Xbox a number of years ago. The song's lyrics, The Problem of Leisure, what to do for pleasure. Seem almost tailor-made for this gadget of time suck technology. Though known for being a Marxist band, Gang of Four were never really against capitalism. They've always been upfront about wanting to operate within its machinery, hence their signing to EMI. They simply want all of us to acknowledge that we are all complicit in capitalism. The classic line, this heaven gives me migraine. The Brits have such a classy way of pronouncing migraine, it makes me want one. Sums up the dissatisfaction of the quote unquote good life. Once you make enough money to achieve the good life, you've already ensured that you'll have nothing to do. Capitalism. Natural's Not In It is one of their classic songs. Not Great Men is a drunken beat funk song with lyrics that imply that all of history 
is made not by great men, in other words, quality people, but rather by the strongest and richest, much to the detriment of the weak and the poor. The song features a great push-pull effect between John's vocals and Andy's guitar, and its rhythms fit in perfectly between the two songs that bookend it. Damaged Goods is one of the band's best songs ever, and it has the musicality to appeal to even the most casual punk listener. Franz Ferdinand built a whole damn career just based on the dynamics of this song. The song's lyrics never had a greater sing-along ability. Yeah, I'm making that a word. The real talk in the line, sometimes I'm thinking that I love you, but I know it's only lust, is juxtaposed with more conceptual lines, as this song uses a financial transaction as an analogy for a bad breakup. The song's narrator is calling out the person who broke up with them on their claim that the change would do me good. He insists that his ex open the till and give me the change you said would do me good. It's a brilliant turn of phrase, and again is on message with the band's capitalist-toned lyrics. Return the Gift is one of the more cryptic songs on this album, and features one of the more active Andy Gill guitar parts. Alan's bass carries the whole song along, and Hugo Burnham's drumming is insanely great. The song decries how workers, who sell their labor on the open market, end up with a life of nothing but work. As evidenced in the line, the grid will be filled. The daily grind leaves workers pleading for some time off to enjoy life. Hence the lines, please send me evenings and weekends. The song has an almost deconstructed guitar solo section, with just enough melody among the dissonance to keep in league with the beat that the tight rhythm section is laying down. The song Guns Before Butter takes its title from a Herman Goring quote, Guns will make us powerful, butter will only make us fat. Who knew that guy liked butter? There are other lines that would seem to imply that the song is about the rise of Nazi Germany. Bismarck once said that the Germans were made of iron and blood, which finds its way into the lyrics. The song's sound is jagged and anxious, with lyrics that speak to a populace under control, with the refrain, just keep quiet, no room for doubt. It's herky-jerky rhythms put to bed aside side one, as perfect as any band could ever hope for. Side two, track one, the power slot, goes to I Found That Essence Rare which is perhaps Gang of Four at their most orthodox on this album. I think that's why they put the song where they did. But I can think of a few other songs on this side that I'd rather have kicked off this side with. That said, it's a killer track, with the perfect balance of biting social commentary and blistering musical attack. In fact, this is Andy Gill at his most Wilco Johnson. I'm going to put a link of Wilco Johnson with Dr. Feelgood in the description below. So check it out so you can hear what I mean. In typical Gang of Four style, the bikini, referred to in the line, the worst thing in 1954 was the bikini, is not the sexy swimsuit, but rather the bikini islands where the atomic bomb testing took place. And this track is sexy and the bomb. Right from its So You Want to Be a Rock and Roll Star intro, the song Glass seems to concern the boredom of a member of a couple who goes outside his house, looks in through the window, and does not like what he sees. Where he once expected an easy life filled with pleasure, the only feeling he now gets comes from nicotine. I think this song, at its core, is about how in a world that created aspirin and backrests and feet rests, it's no wonder that our heads hurt and our backs hurt and our feet hurt. The song Contract continues the domestic theme, taking a newly married couple's dissatisfaction with each other in the bedroom, in which neither can live up to the other's preconceived expectations, and asks, whether their partnership makes the grade as a business contract in our mutual interest. When the band gets in the pocket and John sings, our bodies make us worry over and over, it really sells the despair of the newlyweds. But it doesn't sentimentalize it. Nothing on this album is sentimental. At Home He's a Tourist brings some of the band's best lyrics to the table, and it would really be the one single I'd play for people to show them what Gang of Four is all about. It's almost as easy on the ears as Damaged Goods, but the guitar is as angry as ever. And the song walks a musical tightrope between dissonance and harmony, and John's vocals lay bare the sexual politics of a dysfunctional marriage, where the husband is acting as if he's a tourist in his own home, where he's always out hitting the disco dance floors, looking for sexual conquests. His wife is only looking to gain her husband's interest. It's fairly feminist in its message. The song was very successful and in fact was climbing up the charts at such a rate that they were invited to do Top of the Pops. With one proviso, the band would have to change the line, the rubbers you hide in your top left pocket, 
the band offered to change it to the packets you hide in your top left pocket. But Top of the Pops didn't want any of its viewership who heard the song to know that they had censored the band. So they wanted them to change it the rubbish you hide in your top left pocket, which means nothing. But the band refused because it's stupid. The band were invited back the following week to perform the song, but under the same conditions, and they refused again. Turning down Top of the Pops, according to Hugo Burnham, effectively killed their careers, as it totally soured their relationship with their label, EMI. Can you imagine the look on the A&R guy's face when they walked away from doing that outrageously popular TV show? Crazy. Incidentally, here's the single, At Home He's a Tourist. It seems pretty plain on the front. The packaging is actually brilliant on the back. The back shows two harried housewives who are each assigned speech bubbles with lyrics from the song. This one is saying, at home he's a tourist, at home I'm looking for interest. And the other is saying, he fills his head with culture, he gives himself an ulcer. Sob. The single's B-side is a song called It's Her Factory, which finds drummer Hugo Burnham on Speak Sing lead vocals. When played live, that forced Andy Gill to take over on drums, and the melody is carried by Melodica, played by John King. The overall effect of this song is very reggae dub-like, and thanks to John's melodica, it almost sounds like Augustus Pablo by way of Leeds University. 545 is the most experimental song on this album, with stutter-step rhythms and off-kilter melodies. The lyrics describe how the bloodshed and death on the TV news has simply become a new form of entertainment for people, with freedom fighters' life and death struggles reduced to being a mere distraction for people while they eat their dinner. You can tell from the long, sexy intro to the song Anthrax that something cool is about to happen. When the proper song kicks in, we're treated to some stellar performances by each member of the group. Dave's bass was never sexier, with Hugo's Swiss precision drumming in lockstep with him. Andy's guitar walks that fine line between skronk and scream, and John's vocal performance is equal parts desperate and resigned. The band uses twin vocals to great effect, while John's vocals equate being in love to catching a case of anthrax. Andy's vocals very dryly break down why most groups write love songs. It's a very Brechtian way to construct a song, and I think the band wanted to make us aware of the song's artifice in a way that no other love song ever does. The feeling of a love-starved male is best summed up by the great lines, My head's not empty, it's full with my brain. The thoughts I'm thinking like piss down a drain. Oh, he's in love. It's a killer song that ends a killer album. In October of 1980, the band released Gang of Four, a.k.a. the Gang of Four EP, a.k.a. The Yellow EP, a.k.a. Yellow. Just say it goes by many names. Why are you killing yourself? This EP was packaged solely for the American market and consists of two British singles, Outside the Trains Don't Run on Time and He'd Send in the Army. They're both great singles. Both singles wind up on their following LP, Solid Gold, which I'm about to get to, so I'll talk about them there. If you are a completist, you need this. This version of He'd Send in the Army is the original 7-inch single version. The other two songs on here are It's Her Factory and Armalite Rifle, which were B-sides from earlier singles. This EP was hopefully supposed to get Americans firmly on the Gang of Four bandwagon, but unfortunately the record-buying public did not bite. In March of 1981, the band released Solid Gold. This is a great album. This album is not as revered as entertainment, and I think it gets short shrift because it features some of Gang of Four's best songs. It also saw them wielding more control in the studio and becoming more assured of themselves. So I see this album as almost the equal of entertainment. The song Paralyzed starts the album on an insidious note with a sneakily arresting groove and an occasional guitar part that presages Sonic Youth's Bull in the Heather by a good 13 years. Andy's guitar does the title of the song proud as it alternates between rousing us to dance and stopping cold. The lines, blinkered, paralyzed, flat on my back, are very evocative of the beetle on his back in Anthrax, which is a nice little throwback, and it's a cool way to open this album. What We All Want is perhaps the most underrated song in the band's entire canon. Aside from an outrageously tight groove, it pairs a great vocal performance from John against an angrily discordant guitar performance from Andy. What We All Want asks one of the same questions the band returned to in song after song. Yet very seldom did they put it so succinctly. Could I be happy with something else? I need something to fill my time. Boredom and confusion 
could be seen as two of the effects of capitalism. And this finely crafted song is the standout track on this LP. The Sleeve says the next song is If I Could Keep It For Myself, but it's actually Why Theory. I think there was a little sequencing snafu at the pressing plant, or the band decided at the 11th hour to change the sequencing, and nobody told the guy with the sleeves. In any case, Andy Gill kicks off Y Theory with some gruff vocals against his atonal guitar tone as a distant melodica sounds. My favorite line is, too much thinking makes me ill. I think I'll have another gin. I used to think the line was, too much thinking makes me ill. I think I'll have another kid. I think my line is funnier, but that might be too American a take. Gang of Four return to this notion time after time about human beings either thinking too much or not thinking enough. And as this song proves, it's very fertile ground. If I Could Keep It For Myself is a very rigid track with almost army cadence vocals. Andy's guitar is at its most flinty, for lack of a better word, as he wildly colors outside the lines of the song. The subject matter of If I Could Keep It For Myself blends perfectly into the next song, Outside the Trains Don't Run On Time, which is ostensibly about fascism, specifically a Mussolini type. As the old adage goes, life under Mussolini was terrible, but at least the trains ran on time. Mussolini actually had little to do with the trains. In any case, it's a very sarcastic and funny song. One line about this little dictator that I always find funny, discipline is his passion. What do you do for pleasure? Discipline. Side 2 kicks off with the track Cheeseburger, which sees Gang of Four fix their jaundiced eye firmly on America. The rigged game that is the USA's economy is likened to a game of 8-ball. With the line, I shoot fast while you're talking dollars, see how I will run the table. This song, especially the bridge, is about as Devo-like as Gang of Four get. And you know I love me some Devo, as you can find out by clicking above. The Republic is a very doom-laden track, with some very pretty vocals from John, there's actually a hidden curse amid the chorus's layered vocals. When you hear the line, I'm unconcerned with what's in store, there's an almost subliminal, I don't give a shit what's in store, underneath that line. The song In the Ditch features a great bridge with the line, show me a ditch and I'll dive in it. I believe it's concerning all those who answer the call to go to war and wind up lying in a grave. The chorus, martial music, the beat goes on, get down, down to the floor is funky as fuck, and features Gang of Four at their most faux militaristic. I don't want to belabor the point of how great Gang of Four's lyrics are, but I can't help it with a song like A Hole in the Wallet. Here's the chorus. Why work for love if it shows no profit? You'll only earn emotional losses, wasting time's a hole in the wallet. Think about the brilliance of those lines. Why work for love when it doesn't pay? Time is money. You could be earning valuable dollars. That's the same sarcastic wordplay that was utilized in Anthrax and Damaged Goods. Album Ender, He'd Send in the Army, builds itself up slowly with Andy's scratchy guitar over a hand clap sounding drum until it falls apart and starts back up again. I'm not sure if there's a punk band that has ever played with momentum as much or as well as Gang of Four. You never feel these guys lose the thread when it comes to their listener, even when they totally deconstruct a song, as they do several times during Heat Send in the Army. Incidentally, this version of Heat Send in the Army is re-recorded for the album Solid Gold. It differs from the version on the Yellow EP, which was actually the 7-inch single version, so it's a totally new version on this album. So all you vinyl completists have to buy everything. Capitalism. As I said earlier, this is a fantastic album, and if you already have entertainment, I guarantee you will like this one. In January of 1982, the band released Another Day, Another Dollar. Actually, they didn't release this at all. This is another Warner Brothers release for America only, and yet another attempt to grab an American audience and be like, hey, this band is great. This compilation brought the American market up to date with the band. It features a major single and a top three all-time Gang of Four song for me, To Hell With Poverty. Its B-side is also here, Capital, It Fails Us Now. It also has History's Bunk, a very odd song, which I do not care for, which was the B-side of the What We All Want single. The final two songs, Cheeseburger and What We All Want, both are live versions recorded at the Hammersmith Palais in 81. The live tracks do not sound very good. They are noisy and ragged. However, this EP is worth the price simply for To Hell With Poverty, which might be the quintessential Gang of Four song. From the atonal guitar wails of its slow burn opening, to its infectious bass line, to its brilliant lyrics, 
The band seldom balance their music and their message so well. The band's sense of humor is also on display, as the angry rant to hell with poverty, which at first seems so high-minded and idealistic, is quickly followed by the punchline, we'll get drunk on cheap wine. If you're buying Gang of Four on vinyl, you need to hell with poverty. And I'd call this EP and the yellow EP essential. In May of 1982, the band released Songs of the Free. This album sees a few changes. First of all, the songwriting, which was always split four ways among the original members, is now credited only to Andy Gill and John King. This album also sees the departure of bassist Dave Allen. He left to co-found the band Shriekback, which had a number of UK hits. Dave is replaced by Sarah Lee on bass. And the fact that Dave Allen's absence isn't immediately obvious is a testament to how great Sarah Lee is as a bass player. Spoiler alert, side one is a perfect side of music. So if you slept on this album or avoided it because you thought there was like one good song on it, you really missed out. Album opener, Call Me Up, lays the smack down with one of their most danceable grooves. If there's a real star on this album, it's John King. His vocals have made a leap forward and have become as identifiable as Andy's guitar tone. Speaking of Andy's tone, he's now assimilated his jagged riffs seamlessly into the more dance-oriented agenda of this album. I Love a Man in a Uniform was probably the first song I ever heard by Gang of Four, back when it blew me away as a kid listening to WLIR in New York. I couldn't believe any song could sound exactly like what I wanted to hear back then. With such fun lyrics, sarcastic vocals, and funky guitar, this sexy song concerns a soldier and his girl. This soldier has been so conditioned by the army that he can't even come without first receiving an order. The vocal ejaculation of give me an order still makes me smile. The song We Live As We Dream Alone doesn't let up for one second. First of all, how great a title is that? Beyond that, it's a dance floor burner with perhaps Gang of Four's best lyrics. Yeah, I said it. Try these on for size. We live as we dream alone, to crack the shell we mix with the others. Some flirt with fascism, some lie in the arms of lovers. What? I can't. Where do you go? Where do you even go from that? You know what? I'm a professional. Those are crazy lyrics. Contrast the lyrics of that song with the lyrics of other songs that came out in 1982. Off the top of my head, I don't know. Ebony and Ivory, Man Eater, Hot in the City, let it whip. Whip it all night. It's as if Gang of Four were on a different planet. And in lots of ways, they very much were. The song It Is Not Enough is almost Gang of Four's Wichita lineman, featuring a wife, weary of life's repetitive nature, wondering if she's lived before this life. She can't even lose herself in love, realizing that passion is not what she thought it'd be, because it's completely set on a man's timetable. It's about as feminist as Gang of Four get. And it's a nice reminder that even in 1982, the boys were still the same lovable Marxists who came out of the liberal arts department. It also features one of John's most raw vocals. It's a very powerful track. Life, It's a Shame is an unrelenting attack on power, politics, and corruption, featuring an almost Greek chorus-like refrain. Making money is making sense. Making money is making sense. Usually a proponent of sparseness, Life sees Andy stretch out with sheets of guitar, and he's seldom provided such a thick sonic soundscape. The rhythm section is as tight as ever, and John's vocals connect with the listener, each no more than an outsider looking in on the power structure. As summed up in the lines, you and I, we are satellites. It's a shame. I Will Be a Good Boy almost sounds like it was built out of a slower section edited out of I Love a Man in a Uniform. The song is about as close as Gang of Four get to a straight up love song. I'm pretty sure it makes a case for forgetting about the problems of the world and losing yourself in love, as being a good boy involves dancing with your partner. But as they dance, the dollar is falling. So are they really dancing? Is it saying that you can't ease up on the pedal of the economy for one second while you dance? without the dollar falling? I'm pretty sure that's what it's saying. Never ones to shrink from tackling a meaty song subject. The tune, The History of the World, lays bare the sad but simple fact that who you were born to, for the most part, determines everything you'll ever accomplish in life. The production on this track is some of the best on the album. The song title, Muscle for Brains, 
may paint a certain picture in your head, but I doubt it's accurate. As evidenced in the line, save me from the people who would save me from myself, the track skewers religious leaders who are so dogmatic they're beyond reason and beyond being reasoned with. They've been selling the same meek shall inherit the earth story forever, and though the weak people here have reservations in heaven, down here they're not so fashionable. The song of the instant opens almost as quietly as Patti Smith groups pissing in a river, but slowly gains an intensity, if not volume, as it makes the point that we don't own anything, even ourselves. The only things we do have are those all too fleeting moments when we touch flesh with other people. But is this describing a tender embrace or a sexual assault? As with many great songs, it's open for interpretation. It is a powerful way to end this album. After the Songs of the Free Tour, drummer Hugo Burnham left the band to co-found the group Illustrated Man. He later worked as a session drummer for acts as diverse as ABC, Pill, and Samantha Fox. Hey, naughty girls need drums too. In September of 1983, the band released Hard. This album marks the moment when Gang of Four, in reality, became a Gang of Three. Hugo Burnham's departure would leave John King, Andy Gill, and Sarah Lee as the only credited band members. This album sees the band go full disco. You don't go full disco. Don't worry about it. After only hinting at disco on Songs of the Free, going full disco might have been a reaction to Hugo's departure, as his drumming seems irreplaceable. So they didn't try to replace him. Instead, the band used drum machines and additional drums played by Andy Gill to fuel an album that's a fresh, exciting direction for the band. This album is much maligned, but I think taken on its own terms, this is a fine album with a lot to offer. Opening track Is It Love sets the tone for Gang of Four's new direction with a straight up love song, but even for a song that's ostensibly about love, Gang of Four can't help but allude to the men who own the city, which adds a little mystery to the story. Backing vocalists Brenda White and Alpha Anderson bring some serious heat to this equation, and John correctly dials down the energy and allows this slinky track to seduce rather than convince. I Fled is an up-tempo number with some gorgeous vocals from either Brenda White or Alpha Anderson. The song really cooks and is filled with the vibrant energy of Old Gang of Four. It seems that at this point Andy Gill is focusing on the overall sound including his new responsibility of ensuring that the drums are on point, which may explain why his guitar is content to lay in the cut. The next song, Silver Lining, is entirely the gang of four you remember from Songs of the Free, only better. In fact, on this whole album, it seems as if the band are reveling in their new abilities. Their musicianship has only increased, and it seems they're no longer challenged by the strictures that they previously set for themselves. They're now unapologetically out to conquer the dance floor, and they succeed. Silver Lining is one of my favorites off this album. Andy Gill's guitar returns with some of its old fire, and the song finds the perfect balance between their previous angular work and their new smooth song craft. Woman Town finds the band again taking on the guise of a woman. The woman in question is not only in touch with the collective unconscious of all women who came before her, but makes it very clear how she feels with the line, I don't need you. I'm a woman, not some naming game. The new female backing vocalist really helped to put this song over, and kudos go to Andy Gill for really picking his spots on this one. Hey, remember how Andy was keeping his guitar under wraps on side one? Well, holy hell does he unleash it on side two leadoff track, A Man With A Good Car. Sara Lee's bass gets to shine, as does the backing vocalists and John's melodica, which creatively fill in the spaces around Andy's doom-laden guitar. The song features the killer lines, a man with a good car needs no justification. Fate is in my hands and in the transmission. Let's just take a moment to appreciate how far we've come from Eddie Cochran's, well, my mom and papa told me, son, you gotta make some money if you wanna use the car to go ride next Sunday. Bit of a leap, It Don't Matter, features some inventive bass work from Sarah Lee, as well as some dreamy vocals from John. The band seemed to be imploring us to seize the day. At the very same time, they're telling us it doesn't matter what to do for leisure, am I right? The song Arabic is a very fun song with one foot firmly rooted in the gang's older work. And this song definitely would have fit in on Songs of the Freight. Once again, Sara Lee's bass drives the song so deliciously. And it's no wonder nobody doesn't like Sara Lee. Piece of My Heart at first seems to be a straightforward rave up, but it's a little more complicated than that. It's immediately the kind of song that makes you want to go out dancing. At the same time, the vocals wash over you with the lyrics, Stay at home at night. The mark of Cain is upon you. Anyone want to dance? The album closer, Independence, is one of my favorite songs on the album. 
The chorus features my favorite John King vocal, and the female backing vocals echo him beautifully. This song really showcases the different shades to John's voice, and the song is the better for it. For a lesser band, the loss of Hugo Burnham on drums would have been a death sentence. So for the band to not only turn in a strong album, but for it to end with one of their strongest songs, with a drum machine high in the mix, it can be seen as a declaration of independence from who you thought Gang of Four were. After the tour for the Hard album, the band decided to split up. In 1984, the band released Gang of Four at the Palace. This is a live album from the final incarnation of the band prior to breaking up, as evidenced by the first track on the album where we can hear Andy Gill say, Right, here we are, for the last time. Pretty cool intro. The Palace was a venue in Hollywood, California, and the show was recorded on the Record Plant mobile unit. The crowd is excited, but they're kept low enough in the mix for the band to be loud and clear. And it is a killer performance. It's also harder to think of a better set list. This is a criminally underknown live album. Original members John and Andy are augmented by Sarah Lee on bass and tour drummer Steve Goulding. The gang are backed with two female vocalists, Allison Williams and Paula West, who bring a soulful energy to the band's live sound. It opens with a rousing version of We Live As We Dream Alone and continues with a funky as fuck take on histories not made by great men. Yes, they use that full title here. Spirited live versions of the lesser played tracks Silver Lining and Is It Love put them on a level playing field with classics such as Paralyzed and Damaged Goods. The production is crisp and clear and the performances are spirited. This LP proves what an incendiary live act Gang of Four were. Do not sleep on this album. In 1990, a compilation was released, A Brief History of the 20th Century, with liner notes by Greil Marcus and a wonderful retrospective song list. I highly recommend this overview, encompassing all relevant eras of the band. That was the end of my Gang of Four, but I'm just going to give a brief overview of some of the projects that were released under the Gang of Four moniker. 1991's Maul was dead on arrival, not quite the Gang of Old, and outside of a rather pretty and faithful cover of the Whalers classic, Soul Rebel, there's not much about it for me to recommend. As for 1995's Shrink Wrapped, you needn't bother with this one. Quite frankly, if it didn't have the band name on the cover, you couldn't even tell it was Gang of Four. In 2005, the original members of Gang of Four reunited to play some shows. To coincide with those shows, the band put out the album Return the Gift. Perhaps the coolest thing about it was that it came with a crisp $1 bill. It's a two-disc set. The first disc features re-recordings of the band's classic material. The second disc contains remixes of those recordings. The collection features songs off the Entertainment and Solid Gold albums, as well as two songs off Songs of the Free. Speaking of which, if you were never a fan of the disco effects on I Love a Man in a Uniform, this version does away with that dance-oriented production. But for me, that ruins what made the original great. If the re-recordings are a benefit anywhere, it's in the beefed up sound. Whereas the sound on the Entertainment album was brittle and skinny, here it's rowdy and muscular which I'm sure made Hugo happy because he always hated his drum sound on the Entertainment album. These re-recordings are great. They're fine. But for me and everyone else who already loves the originals, they seem extraneous. So the main question is why. I assume it's for financial reasons. Way back when, the band signed a really shitty contract with EMI that they still haven't seen any royalties from. Band signed a shitty contract. You don't hear that every day. Unable to get control of their masters, the band had clearly hoped to put out what would become definitive versions of their songs. They didn't quite do that, but they did manage to capture the fury of their live sound in a studio setting. And with that in mind, put on your headphones and you'll feel like this band is putting on a kick-ass concert just for you. The remixes are another story. Most of these are terrible, with one exception. The I Love a Man in a Uniform remix, featuring Karen O, aka the Yeah Yeah Yeahs remix. John King sounds so damn good in an echo chamber, and Karen O's voice is always a welcome addition to any song. It's got some distorted electronic noise that no doubt made Andy Gill smile. And by the time the song falls into the delicious pocket of the outro, you'll find that the song is over far too soon. The hip-hop-centric treatment Tony Canal gave to Ether is pretty interesting. But for the most part, the extra disc of remixes is something you'll never listen to. In January of 2011, the band put out Content. This is the last Gang of Four album to feature John King, and his vocals are the best thing on here, creating a continuum between their classic albums 
and the new decade. The opener, She Said You Made a Thing of Me, has vague echoes of the sound of Gang of Four. If the band had been asked to provide a song for the Terminator 2 soundtrack, You Don't Have to Be Mad is fairly conventional, but has a little bit of the old magic. The song Who I Am, though, is where the album goes completely off the rails. It's the worst kind of slick, and its lyrics are obvious and toothless, wasting a fantastic John King vocal performance. 2019's Happy Now was not bad for what it was, in Andy Gill's solo project, but it's nobody but Gang of Four's fault for setting the musical bar so high with their early albums. Point of fact, there isn't much reason to go past the album hard, and though later reunion-era Gang of Four continued to be a fiery live unit, their studio work was no longer as inspired, but Gang of Four's legacy is already assured, and from 1979 to 1983, they made some of the best music around. That is it for this week on Pop Culture Graveyard. Thank you so much for joining me, and I will see you next week with a lot more cool stuff.